Hi, and welcome to Cryptobiography. I'm your host, Brandon Starr. This is episode 340 of Cryptobiography, and it's part 13 of Tomorrow. And here we go. She had no idea of how long it'd be before she'd be married off, but she had an idea that if she could make herself less attractive, it might help put off that day. Knowing first impressions would be important, even though she was already past that with the mayor, she asked if they had a bathroom. They did. She didn't know they had pressurized water, but here up on the second floor, there was a working bathroom, cold water only. There was a mirror, as she suspected there would be. The house on the island also had a mirror. So she was a little shocked by how bad she already looked. She had dark circles under her eyes, and her hair was wild to the point of being matted in places. She looked a bit thinner than she remembered. Perfect, she decided. No improvements needed. She looked awful. And she didn't have too long to wait. Less than an hour after her appraisal, several people came into the room. One was the mayor. Three were very thin people who seemed, even from the first moment she saw them, to be fawning over the mayor. The fifth was an obese young man, how old she wasn't sure, but probably not over twenty. As if she needed confirmation, he looked like a young version of the mayor. They walked over to her, looming above her. "'Is this her?' the young man asked the mayor. "'Yes, this is Betty.' He looked at her appraisingly. "'I see.' Betty did not know what that meant. She would have loved to not care what it meant, but she did. She cared because she hoped it meant he was not much interested in her and would not be pushing to start this awful marriage even sooner than it would otherwise happen. Sit, Luke, and get to know her. The mayor walked right out of the house, possibly going back to his office next door, and most of the others went, went, went with him. One guard stayed, and with three others who were already in the house, the whole room seemed to be taken up by them, though the room was quite, quite large. Luke was just looking at her. She was not about to start a conversation with him. She did not want to know anything about him. The only thing he knew that she might be interested in was information on how to escape this place, and she doubted he really knew anything about that. He stared at her, as though trying to think of something to say. Finally, he asked, Are you really twelve? Yes, she said flatly. You're from the island people? Yes, she wanted to add, What gave it away, the fact that I'm neither emaciated nor obese? But did not. They're very primitive there. He seemed too stupid to be baiting her, so she took this as a sign that He knew nothing about her island and was simply parroting whatever local propaganda said about them. Since she didn't answer, he added, I mean, there's no Bible there. She wasn't so dumb as to say what she was thinking. Instead, she said, there are Bibles there, but there aren't a lot of people who believe them. That's too bad. You think so? Betty snapped. Yes, because without the Bible, you only act like animals. Betty stared at him. You really believe that? We had a perfectly nice community until you people came over and murdered us. He looked at her as though he did not believe her. She felt he was assuming she was talking out of naivete, of not knowing what a real society was. Of course that made her angry. But she was one person, not even fully grown, in a room of enemies, so she held her tongue. She was given a small bedroom. It had no lock that she could access. It didn't lock from the outside either, but there was always a guard at the end of the hall. When she tested things by leaving the bedroom at night, the guard grunted at her. She went back to bed. She had time to herself, though always with at least one guard watching her. She wandered the parts of the house she was allowed to see and the yard all around. She inspected the wall but it seemed to be the same impenetrable metal everywhere with no easy way to climb over. She also, from the second floor, the highest she was allowed to see, looked past the walls at all the buildings and streets outside and every direction. She didn't have any brainstorm about how knowing those buildings would help her get over the wall, 
but she felt that having a strong internal map of everything she could see would be of help if ever she got the opportunity to escape. Soon the area around the house became like a little world to her. She had long since memorized all the buildings, roads, and usual objects visible outside the fence, as well as all the details of the house that she was allowed to visit. In a strange way, they seemed to be nice to her. She was allowed more or less to go where and when she willed on the grounds, always with a guard or two. It was like they didn't want her to feel like a prisoner. If that was their intent, it may have helped assuage their guilt, but it didn't do much for Betty. At night, memories of her friends, family, and neighbors all swam in front of her eyes. The ache to see them again, even to just visit the island, would sometimes hurt her stomach. She tried not to cry too much. She wanted them to relax, to think she wasn't thinking of escape. But really, that was all she thought about, at least during the day, when she was constantly evaluating and re-evaluating her fancy cage. And that's the end of the episode for today. If you have any comments or questions about this episode or previous episodes, cryptobiography at gmail.com or hit us up on Facebook, Twitter, or Mastodon. And I'm working on, um, what's the other one? Threads as well. Uh, but I don't have that one up yet, quite yet. Uh, so thanks for listening again. Words of Music, copyright 2023, Brandon Starr, all rights reserved. Characters and events are fictional, fictionalized, or satirical. <laughs>